Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, before we start, can I ask you to take out anything you've got that's uh, chirping, squawking, etc. If you could uh, put that on airplane mode, mute, uh, turn it off, whatever, whatever works. So we don't have those distractions. Thank you. I'm Glenn Moots. I'm a professor here at Northern University and also director of the university's Forum for Citizenship and Enterprise. We're a university center. We started in uh, 2009, and our work is basically to bring uh, panel or panelists, uh, debates, uh, speakers, programs such as that. And I'd like to welcome you to our event tonight, which is part of our year-long program. Some of you have probably been to some of our programs in the fall. Our theme is America and the World. I'd also like to welcome you tonight on behalf of our co-sponsors, the Institute for Humane Studies. They've been generous co-sponsors of our programs for the past few years. They're located in Arlington, Virginia. IHS advances a freer society by facilitating development of students and scholars who share an interest in liberty. And students, IHS has a variety of programs designed to support you as an undergraduate or as a graduate student. And if you have questions about those programs, please contact me and I'm happy to assist. Also tonight, we want your feedback. You've received a small piece of paper with a URL and a QR code. And if you could use this to give us feedback at the conclusion of the debate, we sure would appreciate that. Also tonight, we have a reception, just an informal reception out here in the lobby. You're welcome to join us for that. Tonight's debate is about American immigration policy, a topic that remains a top issue for voters ahead of the 2020 election and will even be mentioned in tonight's State of the Union address. In particular, we are considering mass immigration, phenomena where in large numbers relocate from one country to another. In America, for example, the number of foreign-born individuals increased five-fold from 1970 to 2017, and a recent MIT Yale study calculated that undocumented persons are twice the number currently estimated, 22 million versus 11 million. Now, America, of course, has always welcomed immigrants, but each generation is also inclined to revisit the question of whether there is such a thing as too much. And open discussions can be awkward. No one wants to appear ambivalent or insensitive, but civil discourse is important in a democracy, and that's why we host these debates, to hear both sides. Arguing for a more relaxed immigration policy tonight is Mr. Nick Gillespie on my left. Mr. Gillespie is editor-at-large of Reason Magazine, and he has served as editor-in-chief of the magazine, as well as Reason.com and Reason TV. His essays have appeared in a host of top publications, such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. He's also been a frequent contributor to NPR, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, Fox Business, and PBS. He's also an author and producer of award-winning books and documentaries. As a writer, Mr. Gillespie has been at the forefront of the libertarian movement advancing many causes that were very much advocated only by a minority even 10 years ago, and he does it with style and a pop culture sensibility. He's almost certainly the only journalist to have interviewed both Ozzy Osbourne and Nobel laureates Milton Friedman and Vernon Smith. Mr. Gillespie received his PhD in English literature from State University of New York at Buffalo, holds an MA in English from Temple, and a BA in English and Psychology from Rutgers. Arguing on my right for a more restrictive immigration policy is Ramesh Panuru. Mr. Panuru is a senior is a senior editor for National Review. He is also a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, a contributor to CBS News, a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and a senior fellow at National Review Institute. He's also a contributing editor to the domestic policy journal National Affairs, and like Nick, has appeared in a variety of top outlets, such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. As an author, he has written one of the most articulate defenses of the pro-life cause, 
and is co-editor of a widely praised book on public policy titled Room to Grow, Conservative Reforms for a Limited Government and Thriving Middle Class. He graduated summa cum laude from Princeton in 1995. Andrew Sullivan, who was originally scheduled to argue against mass immigration, was ordered by his doctors not to travel. And so we are very thankful to have Mr. Panuru with us, agreeing to fill in on very short notice. Our moderator tonight is someone you will recognize better if you close your eyes, because you have heard David Nicholas on CMU Public Broadcasting. He has been producer and host for public affairs programming and also hosts a variety of uh, music programs. Um, he also takes the lead on much uh, election and political coverage, and we're pleased to have David with us tonight to moderate our debate. Let me tell you about our format. We'll begin with opening statements. Our speakers have 20 minutes for those. We then move to cross-examination. Each speaker has five minutes to question the other. And at that point, we turn the debate over to you. This is your opportunity to use those little pieces of paper that you were given on the way in to ask questions of our debaters. We have some student volunteers. They will be collecting those papers and they will be bringing them up to the moderator. The moderator, after a short break, will begin asking our debaters your questions. So that's your opportunity to get involved. We'll do that for 15 minutes and then when we conclude, uh, each speaker will have five minutes for closing arguments. Now, please join me in welcoming our debaters and David Nicholas. Good evening and welcome. Thank you to uh, Professor Moots for inviting me back once again. I'm very happy to be working with both panelists this evening. A couple of years ago, um, I was here for one of the events in the fall season, uh, these events that uh, Professor Moots has, has uh, sponsored, and we were going up against uh, game six or seven of the World Series Cubs and Indians. Um, tonight, we're running up, of course, against the State of the Union, so with all due respect to our guests, we kind of always feel like maybe we're the warm-up band, but we will, uh, we will proceed uh, just the same. As uh, Professor Mood said, we are going to open uh, 20 minutes that we will get out of the way and let both of our speakers have uh, the floor to make their uh, opening remarks and uh, predetermine. We will uh, turn uh, first to Ramesh Benuru for his opening statement. Well, first of all, let me thank you all for being here. I uh, appreciate, uh, like the airlines, I know you have other options. And uh, uh, it's great to be here on my first trip to Northwood and indeed to this part of Michigan. There are some seats in the front, if any of you in the who are standing would like to uh, come down here. I count maybe uh, five or six up here in the front, if you'd like that. This is a particular uh, honor for me um, to be here uh, under the auspices of the Institute for Humane Studies. I a, attended a seminar uh, sponsored by IHS way back when I was in college, which was uh, a long time ago, previous century. My, my then eight-year-old, when we were passing by her grade school, asked me, why, why are the numbers 1868 on a sign outside the school? I said, oh, well, that's 1868. That's when your school was founded. Then, were you there? <laughs> so not not quite that long ago, but uh, but it does sometimes feel that way. So I am here to defend the proposition that mass immigration is bad for America. And uh, before actually going to the work of defending, let me praise the proposition because sometimes. When we argue about immigration, discuss immigration, uh, the terms are set in, uh, and I, I guess maybe a more flat-footed way, uh, as being a question of sort of whether we're for immigration or against immigration. And the the phrasing mass immigration, I think, helps to focus our minds on the question of quantity, uh, on the idea that, uh, as with medicine, um, uh, the the poison is in the dose, uh, and one can welcome a great deal of immigration, 
while also wanting to impose limits on it. I think good for America is another useful phrase in this discussion because sometimes our discussions of immigration proceed in a kind of abstraction that is vague about the interests that we are trying to support. Uh, and in my view, the interests that ought to count most in immigration policy are the interests of people who are already lawful citizens of the United States. That is, people, whether they were born here or whether they're immigrants here, uh, who are already part of the political community of the United States. If I were to make one modification to the proposition that I'm defending here, that mass immigration is bad for America, I might say continuous mass immigration is bad for America, because I think, as I'll explain in a little bit more detail later, that the key factor in making immigration successful for the United States, for newcomers and native-born Americans alike, is that assimilation take place, and that that assimilation is most likely to be advanced when immigration is either kept to a moderate level in terms of numbers, or is interrupted by pauses in which we assimilate the people who've come here. So for example, the 1890 to 1920 period of mass immigration is remembered as successful and was successful to a large degree because we took a long time pausing from mass immigration during which a lot of assimilation took place. I refer to 1920, 1965. So we have about 50 million people in this country who were born elsewhere. The percentage of people in our country uh, who are immigrants is approaching its historical peak and is set to go on past that peak. Um, the peak should be hit um, later in this decade according to demographic projections. And what I would argue is that we would be better off with a bit less immigration, but perhaps even more with a different system of immigration and with an immigration system that deserves to be called a system. That is an immigration policy that looks as though it were designed on purpose, which is not the immigration system that we have today. A deliberate immigration policy, one might say. I do think that given the context of our recent political arguments about immigration, I should introduce a couple of qualifications to the thesis so as to prevent misunderstanding uh, and to, uh, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from on this set of issues. Um, this debate could have been a more stark contrast of positions um, than it is. I think of myself as a moderate restrictionist on immigration um, for a number of reasons. I think that, uh, for example, uh, a, a border wall on our southern border, the border with Mexico, um, is uh, neither a necessary nor a sufficient policy for the kind of immigration control that I would like to see. Uh, I am in favor of enhanced physical structures and parts of the border, but the idea of a wall going across the border, a big gleaming wall, I think it has been described as, uh, doesn't is not part of my agenda. Of course, it doesn't actually appear to be part of the current administration's agenda either, if you pay close attention to what it's actually doing. Uh, I think that uh, President Trump's association of immigration with violent crime is demagogic at the very least, uh, is not supported by the data, and is uh, uh, something that, that stirrups enmity um, where it should not be. I'm in favor of birthright citizenship, unlike the administration and a lot of Republican congressmen. In fact, the way I got my citizenship, um, as an aside, when my, my brothers were born in India, my older brothers, and somehow when we were kids, it got into our heads that this was the key distinguishing factor between people who were going to go on to be presidents and those who weren't. 
and the the idea was that I had a really good shot at it, uh, and and they did not. It turns out not to quite work that way. It's in fact an incredibly labyrinthine process that the good citizens of Iowa have not yet mastered. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, by way of distinguishing my positions from from folks who are, uh, let's say, to my right on the immigration issue, uh, I think that the zero tolerance policy that the administration embarked on uh, in the spring of 2018 with the predictable consequence of mass separation of families was uh, grossly immoral, a humanitarian and practical and political disaster um, that all by itself is a reason uh, that I am unlikely to vote for the re-election of the incumbent. With those qualifications in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit more sort of positively about the considerations and principles that I think ought to underlie our immigration policy. And, and the first point I'd like to make uh, is that the sort of macroeconomic considerations that are usually brought up in this context are basically beside the point. That the macroeconomic arguments for immigration that are widely put forward are deeply unpersuasive. It is true that immigration, increased immigration, uh, and increased immigration is very, very likely to increase the size of our economy, and decreased immigration is very likely to shrink our economy, and usually, a policy that increases our immigration, excuse me, increases the size of our economy is a good thing, and a policy that decreases the size of our economy is a bad thing. But immigration is a particularly uh, tricky issue on this score in part because the usual considerations don't apply. Uh, in this case, what you'd want to look at, I think, more closely is the effect of immigration on, first of all, GDP per capita, that is, the size of the economy per person, and particularly whether the immigration is benefiting the people who are already here. Again, both native-born Americans and the immigrants we've already taken in. And when you look at those figures, it turns out that the benefits of immigration are nugatory. People will often cite numbers on the economic benefits of immigration that gloss over this point. They talk about the benefit to the economy overall, to GDP, to GNP. However, entirely understandably and naturally, most of that added benefit accrues to the immigrants themselves. And of course, the number of people who are taking part in this economy increases with immigration. If you look at the statistics that look a little bit closer at the effect on individual people, you see almost no effect. So, for example, in 2013, the Congressional Budget Office estimated the economic effect of a, of a bipartisan immigration reform bill that, among other things, would have double, doubled excuse me, the amount of immigration in the United States over the next decade. And what it found that was that in 20 years' time, it would increase GDP per capita by zero 0.2%. Not nothing, but also the kind of estimate that could easily be swamped by other factors that could turn out to be wrong just as a, a projection error and is not really the kind of thing that ought to motivate a major policy change. The distributional effects of immigration, on the other hand, are different. Uh, they are, I think, more of a reason to act. And one of the findings that we see in uh, the literature on the economic effects of immigration is that, it, that the more immigration you have, particularly the more low-skilled immigration, the lower the wages, the lower the income of low-wage workers. This, too, is a point that often gets glossed over. And what people will say correctly, is that the literature does not prove that there is a negative effect on native-born American workers. However, even the most optimistic looks 
at the effects of immigration suggest that the more low skilled immigration we have, the lower the wages, the lower the incomes of the immigrants themselves. And this, I think, is a very important consideration because when we bring immigrants in, we want them to be successful. We want them to integrate into American life. This is what I mean when I talk about assimilation, which is the second point I want to make, in addition to the economic arguments being not particularly decisive, that assimilation is key. People mean different things when they talk about assimilation. What I mean is not the idea that immigrants have to abandon all of the cultural traditions of their ancestral countries. Doesn't mean you have to abandon the language. You have to ab abandon the cuisine or the holidays. What I mean is that newcomers and native born Americans alike have to see themselves as part of the same society, to regard themselves as having common interests, to be able to work together for those common interests and to be able to communicate with one another in order to participate in that project. That assimilation, I think, has an economic component. You don't want enclaves of ethnic poverty that are geographically concentrated. You want everybody to have a shot at becoming part of our society fully and being seen by themselves and by others as full participants in our society in all of its dimensions, our culture, our politics, and our economy. And an immigration policy that results in immigrants being a cast apart, in their having lower wages, um, in uh, newcomers constantly not being able to rise up the economic ladder, uh, seems to me to be a failure, a mistake, suboptimal. Now it's also, I think, important because we can get sidetracked when we talk about assimilation, we talk about the imperative of building social cohesion in the face of immigration, we can often get sidetracked into a discussion of whether today's immigrants are better or worse people than yesterday's immigrants. And today's immigrants, like yesterday's immigrants, like today's and yesterday's native-born Americans, are a mix of virtues and vices, talents and flaws. What I think has changed is not so much the immigrants as the context of the society to which they are coming and into which we would like them to assimilate. So a hundred years ago, um, there were many more ladders of opportunity. If you started with little formal education, if you were starting with low wage jobs, um, there were much greater pressures, um, formal and informal, some of them coercive, some of them not, toward assimilation. There were fewer ties to the old country to impede assimilation. Transportation costs were higher. Communications technology was less advanced, for example. So my argument here is not that the immigration policy of yesterday was necessarily wrong or the immigrants of yesterday were necessarily better. It's that the context has changed and that when those circumstances change, our immigration policy ought to change accordingly to match what is actually in America's national interest. And I would say the part of the reason that I favor a different immigration policy is because of the political effects. When you have the kind of political reaction against immigration that we have had in our country over the last several years, I think it is a sign that we are beginning to outstrip our absorptive capacity. Most Americans favor immigration. That tendency has actually increased in recent years, but there is still pretty strong resistance. And I would go so far as to argue that without that resistance, we probably wouldn't have our current president, probably wouldn't have won the Republican nomination or won the general election if there wasn't such resistance. Which is again, I think a sign 
because it's not as though we can tell sort of deductively or mathematically how much is too much, uh, when should we cut back. Uh, but I think that it is clear that we could cut back the amount of immigration that we have or change our immigration policies in a way that would not harm our economy and that would be conducive to immigrant success and social cohesion. Uh, so I'd like to, to, to finish a, by talking a little bit about the dimensions of the better policy that I would like to see happen. Um, we are not going to have a pure open borders policy. There is a very tiny subset of our population of libertarians who would like to see no immigration controls whatsoever. And my, my uh, fellow debater, Nick, is uh, probably in that camp. That's not going to happen. We do have immigration limits. We have decided to take in immigrants on a nearly arbitrary basis, on, uh, on the basis of who happens to be related to people who are here, on the basis of proximity and so forth. Uh, I think we should move towards a more skills-based approach to immigration policy and away from the reunification of extended families. I think that we should uh, adopt a, an immigration policy in which Americans can believe that there will be enforcement going forward, that we're going to have an immigration policy worthy of the name, which involves, among other things, making sure that employers verify the legal status of new hires, because we're not going to be able to maintain enforcement at the border if we don't maintain enforcement at the workplace. And I would just like to say in my, my last little minutes here, um, once we have that kind of policy in place, I think we can talk about providing legal status to illegal immigrants who have put down roots in our country. We could do that sort of thing in stages. But what I think we mostly need is a, is a compromise policy that takes account of the various legitimate interests that people have in our country, newcomers, native-born people alike, people who want immigrants to help them with housework, people who are worried about competing with immigrants in the labor market. That is the way forward. And I will now uh, leave this open to Nick to make the argument for pure, unrealistic libertarian ideology. It was a, uh, a generous offer. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm actually going to reject it, though, because I don't uh, uh, when people talk about open borders, it's never really clear what they mean. Um, what I want to talk about, though, is, the, you know, the proposition, is mass immigration bad for America? And I want to answer not just, uh, you know, uh, Herman Melville once said that what was great about Nathaniel Hawthorne is that in American literature and American letters, he said, no in thunder. And I want to say, is, uh, is mass immigration bad for America? I want to say, hell no in thunder, because mass immigration has been excellent for America, and it can continue to be. We should have reforms. Uh, and I'm actually kind of a little bit uh, off kilter, put off kilter by Ramesh, because he's being very moderate here, which a lot of people who are immigration restrictionists are. They trade in racial stereotypes. Uh, you know, as Donald Trump did when he announced within five minutes of announcing for president, he started likening Mexicans to rapists, drug dealers, uh, plague carriers, swarming across the border, apparently uh, unfamiliar with the fact that we had reached peak Mexican immigration sometime in the mid-2000s, uh, around 2007, 2008. But what I want to ask then is, um, you know, is mass immigration bad for not, you know, let's take it down from the, the national level and talk about it more in a way that we can actually think about it. And what I want to ask you to consider, is mass immigration bad for Midland, Michigan? Okay, and this way maybe we can talk about it with, a, with you know, in a, in a little bit more sense. Um, we are in an era of mass immigration, and I think Ramesh would, uh, would agree with that. We've had long sustained influxes of immigrants, both legal and illegal, and we can talk about exactly whether that status matters as much as we might think it does. Uh, but regardless of that, we've had, we basically have about a million net people coming into the country every year. And that works out to somewhere around three tenths or four tenths of percent of the population of America. 
So let's think about what that looks like in Midland. People, uh, as you guys probably know, Midland has a population. I was looking it up on Wikipedia using census data of about 41,800 people. So four tenths of uh, one, uh, four tenths of a percent of that would be about 200 people added every year to Midland of Texas. That's mass immigration as we define it at the country level hitting Midland. Is that something you can handle? Is that good or bad? Is it completely re changing the, the nature of your society or whatnot? What I would argue and what I would like to argue is that I think that kind of mass immigration, let's double it. Let's say 400 people, 500 people a year, new coming to Midland, which by the way, you guys, you realize you've lost population over the past decade since the last, but 500 people a year, I think it would be good for a number of reasons, and these are broad terms to consider. Immigrants in general, they're young. They're younger than the average person coming to America. They're hardworking. They participate very heavily in the labor force. Uh, they start businesses more often than native-born people. They commit fewer crimes. Uh, they do jobs that the rest of us won't do. Uh, which is actually true. They clean the gutters, they clean the toilets, they vacuum, they cut the grass, they take care of our children. Uh, that oftentimes we don't either have time or the, uh, the interest in doing it. And this is just unskilled workers creating a service economy that frees the rest of us up, not to, you know, you know get drunk and, uh, you know, carouse, although there's some of that, but it allows us either to do higher level work that is very productive. How many of you are lawyers? Anybody in the room? Nobody wants to admit it, I get that, okay? But <laughs> let me put it this way. How many of you uh, hire a housekeeper to clean your house? Okay, what do you do with the time that you save? You know, you either do more work or you have more time with your family. You get something out of that, the housekeeper gets something out of that. That's the kind of work that an unskilled, a low-skilled immigrant would do. If you had a couple hundred more of those people coming to Midland every year, you might have more restaurants. You would cook less, but you might take your family out to eat and have more quality time together. This is, the, this is how immigration works in America, and this is mass immigration, a few hundred people a year adding on. Can you handle that in this community? Would that make this community more interesting or less interesting? Um, and, I, and I'm glad that, you know, Ramesh kind of laid this out. Immigrants aren't, they're not soaking up welfare. They're not, you know, committing crimes. They're not doing drugs. They're not stealing babies, things like that. Um, newcomers um, do mix things up, though. Um, and newcomers don't necessarily look like most of us. This is, I was going to say this is an incredibly diverse room. I mean, I suspect that some of you have visited Ohio. Uh, you've been to Wisconsin, maybe even gone to Canada from time to time. Uh, but you're, it's a pretty homogeneous mix, right? Um, newcomers increasingly come from countries that are very different. In, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, you know, people were coming from Central Europe and Southern Europe. Those were new parts of the world to start entering America en masse. There had been a lot of people from Germany and England and from the uh, Scandinavian countries, Ireland as well. Um, people got freaked out when it was Italians, when it was Poles, when it was Jews uh, coming. The, the big three groups that come to America now are Latinos, less so from Mexico, although for a long time it's been Mexicans, uh, but it's uh, Indians or people from uh, South Asia, as well as China. Those are the three groups, and actually Indians and Asians, or rather Indians and Chinese people are the big groups coming in now. They look different. They seem to come from diff very different countries. Rush, you're Catholic, right? You're raised Catholic. Yeah, no, no, I was raised Catholic as well, and, and being Catholic was seen as very strange um, in the early part of the 20th century. It's very exotic and very much feared by people. Um, I don't even know what religion most Chinese people are. Um, it could be any number of things, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, but it, newcomers mix things up, and that makes people worrisome. Um, and I really, um, 
you know, by the same token, what they do, and again, we're not talking, when we're talking about mass immigration, you know, it's a lot when you count it all up, but when you start to break it down into what's coming into your community, it's a little bit more manageable, even when they're different. Um, immigrants in America do not come to Michigan, by and large. Uh, most immigrants in America go to three states, uh, which I have written down here, California, Texas, and New York. Uh, the vast majority, about two-thirds, go to 20 metropolitan areas, including, and the big three are New York, uh, Los Angeles, and Miami. <clears throat> um, they tend to go to places where they already have beachheads or they already have communities, and they work their way into assimilating by that way. Um, so we get worried. I mean, how many of you are worried when you see people who look different than you? I mean, if we're being honest. I guess either nobody's being honest or you guys are, uh, but it, it's understandable, right, when you see people who seem to be very different. But by the same token, what they do, what immigrants do, is they pump new blood, cultural blood, uh, social blood, economic blood into a country, into a country that is kind of a Geritol nation. We, anybody here remember Geritol at all? Okay, this is, it was iron for your blood, for tired blood. We are an aging country. Um, we need new blood, uh, figuratively. We don't need new blood, literally. Um, immigrants and their children are responsible for founding 46% of Fortune 500 companies in 2017. Of the country of the companies that were there, uh, you know they bring they bring something new. Fifty-five percent of one billion dollar startups have an immigrant founder, uh, which is kind of interesting, which is kind of nice. Anybody drive a Tesla? You know that was founded. I realize I'm you know in big three territory here and things like that, but it's new people are bringing new ideas, new blood, new new possibilities. Did anybody watch the Super Bowl halftime show? Okay, um, you know, uh, Jennifer Lopez is the daughter of Puerto Rican migrants. They're American citizens, but they moved from Puerto Rico to New York. She, moved, she grew up in the uh, South Bronx. Um, you know, that's bringing something. Does anybody here like Frank Sinatra? Frank Sinatra was the son of, uh, actually the grandson of immigrants from one of the most hated countries that came to America, to Italy in the time. Uh, th this is what mass immigration is bringing us. And as Ramesh pointed out, it's not really changing the economy in any massive way that is screwing over people. It's helping to expand it slightly. It can have some very positive effects and it can have some marginal, I think the word was nugatory negative effects. Um, if you want to look around America and you see the places where things are thriving, you will find a lot of immigrants there. Um, this is not a coincidence. Immigrants go to places that have a lot of economic activity, and then they help fuel, fuel it a little bit further. Um, and, not, and not just economic activity, but cultural activity in a way. Um, what I'm going to do is to, uh, I'm, I'm going to wind down pretty quickly here. Um, and I want to talk about this in a, in a personal way, um, because immigration ultimately, we can make, economic arguments about it, and I think I think Ramesh is right, that the, the economics, we can get to a certain place and a certain understanding of what, what are the effects of large sustained waves of immigration. Um, you can talk about it economically, and you know there, we need to. We need to have a common set of facts that we can look at, but it turns out that the effects of immigration on the economy, it's not fully clear and they're not determined in any particular way, but we should be talking about this in a personal way, and again, I want to, you know, think about it on a personal level. Would Midland be better off with 400 or 500 new people moving here every year for the foreseeable future? Would you be able to handle that? Would it make the economy, would it make your cultural life, would it make your dating life a little more interesting or not? Can you handle that? Can you expand to do that? Um, and what I want to argue is that we need to encourage mass migration at all levels of skills. Uh, Ramesh is absolutely correct, and Reason Magazine, you know, which I've written for and edited and whatever, for the past 25, 26 years, we, at one point, we did a story that just tried to explain 
How do you actually get a green card? How do you get legal in America? And it is a nightmare. It is not a, it's a system, if it's designed, it was designed by a madman. Um, there's not a lot of intentionality in it, uh, but it is very complex. It's very confusing. It's very disheartening. It's not something we should be proud of. Um, and as a libertarian, I tend to assume the government is not going to do things well. Uh, this is a very inefficient system that is costly to everybody involved. Um, having said that, one of the reasons we need to encourage mass migration, and I think at all levels of skill, is to rebut what uh, Steve King, the congressman from Iowa, Republican uh, congressman from Iowa, in 2017, he was citing a racist Dutch politician uh, Geert Wilders, who is uh, who's a racist, and that neither, is, in a way, is neither here nor there, but he's a keep Holland for the Dutch type of guy. And um, uh, Steve King said, we can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. And this struck me in a weird way, um, because my all four of my grandparents were immigrants. They all came here in the 19-teens. My mother's family was from Italy. Uh, from a small town in, the, in southern Italy, they were had been peasants and serfs for a thousand years. My father's family came from Ireland, also similarly, uh, they were uh, serfs. They, uh, they had nothing special. Uh, they managed to get into this country before the early 1920s, when immigration laws were changed on explicitly racial basis. If you go back and you read the legislative history of why America passed restriction on European immigration. It is out there, uh, people like my relatives, my ancestors, Jews, uh, Hungarians, people from Central Europe were considered subhuman, were considered not good enough to mix with American bloods. And yet it was precisely these people who restored or maintained American civilization. And I'll, I'll just speak about my mother's parents who were Italian immigrants who never spoke English. Um, and what they did was they raised four children during the Depression. My grandfather dug basements with a, 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 pick, a shovel and a pick by hand with another guy. They raised children who fought in World War II, uh, as well as Korea. Uh, my father, the son of an Irish immigrant who left Ireland partly to avoid service in World War I. Uh, my father landed in Normandy. Uh, he restored our civilization, or he, he kept our civilizations. Um, my parents were other people's babies. And they are, they are the people who we owe a, an enormous amount of uh, gratitude to. My parents, my grandparents, uh, all of the immigrants. How many of you here are, you know, uh, have grandparents who were born in a foreign country? How many of you have uh, parents who were born in another state? who are also migrants to Michigan, some. This is what immigration does, is it restores and it abets, and it keeps our civilization, our societies, fresh, new, forward-looking. Um, it is manageable in the numbers that we have now, and I would like to talk in the uh, question and answer about what would happen if we actually said, we're gonna have unlimited, we're gonna let anybody who comes to America, anybody who wants to come to America, can come here. What would that? How would that actually change the numbers and things like that? It's it's a good conversation to have. I'm not necessarily pushing for that, but this is the power of immigration in America. It is what defines us as a nation, certainly in the 20th century, and I think increasingly in the 21st. And I think it's something that we should worth. Uh, we should. It, it's a um, it's a tradition, it's a history that we should keep alive, especially in a 21st century world where it is easier to go from one place to another, where our futures may lie you know, in Asia. Um, many of you, especially if you're students, you're gonna be, you may end up working most of your life in places like China or Latin America, parts of the uh, developing world that are growing much faster than North America or Western Europe. Um, immigration is a good thing. My grandparents, my Italian grandparents, didn't speak English. Uh, I never had a real conversation with them. I owe them a, grat of debt, a debt of gratitude. And one of the ways that I want to repay that is by keeping immigration open, 
for newcomers here because it's also important. Uh, Ramesh had mentioned that, you know, most of the benefits of immigration accrue to the immigrant. That's not a bad thing. That's part of what makes America exceptional. That's part of what makes America great. And I think we should um, try to, uh, you know, preserve that and actually extend that into a 21st century. I'm going to stop there. And uh, why don't we uh, pick it up for that? Thank you. You've heard the extended views of both of our guests tonight, and I hope that some of you are from the statements from both are beginning to formulate some of those questions. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're going to give them first an opportunity to question each other, uh, and we are not going to necessarily put limitations on that other than uh, to let them zero in on some of the points that they observe from uh, what the others uh, said. So. Uh, we will begin. The opening uh, comments started with Ramesh. So in terms of a cross-examination, we will start with Nick to question uh, Ramesh as they cross-examine each other. Um, Ramesh, in some of your writings, you've, you've looked at places like Canada that have point systems. Could you explain how that, how that would work and what percentage of contemporary immigrant, or, or not contemporary, but a current immigration, how much do you think would not meet whatever point system that we're talking about? So um, there are a variety of ways to move towards a more skills-based immigration system. And one of them is to adapt something like the Canadian model of giving points to people. You could give points to people on the basis of their educational credentials or their, their passage of tests or their facility with the English language or their passing an American civics test or all of those things or, and, uh, and others. Um, the, obviously, depending on which system you adopt, the, the effects would be different. Generally, what you would find is that very, very few people uh, among past immigrants or even among native born people here would pass the test and meet the threshold because a lot of people around the world want to come to the United States. And if you were to keep it towards, you know, the roughly 1 million people we take in every year, for example, um, that would be a pretty high bar uh, to pass. Um, so sometimes people will say, well, you know, my grandparents couldn't have come here if this had been in place. Well, yeah, different situation now. Um, a, another question, I guess, that I have is, um, what what would a uh, an immigration timeout look for? And, I, and I'll say this to somebody: I, I'm a immigration maximalist, I guess, is a way of saying it. Um, I don't think open borders is a useful term anymore, and I spin out a little bit more what I mean uh, by being a maximalist without necessarily being open borders, but. What would a timeout look like? Because there is, and, and this is a serious question for people who are pro-immigration. It is true that there was this huge moment from about 1880 to about 1920, 1925, or maybe 1930, if you want to expand, where there was a huge prolonged immigration. Um, and then came both the 1924 legislation, which really dropped immigration very quickly, the Depression, World War II, the rebuilding of Europe, where immigrants from Europe stopped coming here and things like that. And there was a good chunk of time from about 1925, 1930 until about 1965 or 1970. In the 1970 census, under 5% of the population of America was, was foreign born, the lowest amount ever, you know, recorded in history. Um, so there was that huge moment where things, people were assimilated. And new, newcomers were not coming in the same numbers. But what would, what would your number look like? I mean, would it be five years? Would it be 10 years? How would we know when we've assimilated it? So um, I wouldn't have a timeout from immigration in the sense of moving to near zero for five, 10, or any number of years. What I would like to see is a more deliberate policy that involved a reduction in numbers. So maybe something more like 500,000 
immigrants per year, which is still a pretty large number, but continued indefinitely. Um, so I don't, I don't think we have to think of it in terms of sort of boom and bust cycles. Uh, and I think that, you know, look, I think there are reasons to want uh, a significant number of immigrants. Uh, but I, I just think that our absorptive capacity is, uh, is finite uh, and that immigrants would be more successful and we would have a happier experience with immigration with slightly lower numbers and a different selection process. Okay. I guess my final question for you would be, um, you know, what kind of faith do you have in the U.S. government either predicting the labor force needs of America 5, 10, 15 years into the future or even in the immediacy. I mean, and, and, and the immigration system is arguably the worst, uh, you know, just it's, it's so insufferable. And I'm sure your parents probably have, you know, stories to tell about this. Everybody I know, including people who came on H-1B visas, so these are highly educated workers in short supply, people with PhDs who have employers helping them get in. It's really tough. But I mean, do you have faith as a conservative and a skeptic of the government efficiency, you know, second only probably to libertarians, that the government can get this right or that they would be looking for the right things that will help us down the road? Well, I think that what you are saying is a very, very good argument against a too prescriptive system. One that says we need this number of electrical engineers this year and so forth. I think the criteria should be loose, should be compatible with uh, people being involved in a fluid labor market. Um, so it, it just seems like that's a consideration to take in mind and not to be that detailed about it, but it's not a reason not to have a skills basis. Now, Ramesh, to uh, take about five minutes. Sure. Your questions to Nick. So uh, I had mentioned the, the bipartisan legislation from a few years ago that would have doubled immigration levels. Um, to what national problem is a doubling of immigration levels a solution? Uh, okay. Uh, when you say to what problem is a doubling of numbers, one, I would say we have a problem here where we have large numbers of illegal immigrants. Um, it's never a good thing when you have large numbers of people flouting the law. Um, and that can be because we're an, a nation of rapists and murderers and people who just don't care, or it can be more of a prohibition problem. So, for instance, you know, we have a drug war problem with something like marijuana or intoxicants because people want to get high, um, but we don't have laws or we have liquor prohibition. The problem wasn't with drinking. It was with trying to keep people from drinking in a way that responsible adults could do. Um, I think one of the things that doubling the amount of legal immigration would do is that it would bring people who are coming in here illegally, would if they could come in legally, um, it would solve a lot of problems. One, it would uh, minimize the kind of exploitation of those people. Uh, it would also, uh, because they would be able, if they were being abused by uh, any number of people in society, including employers, but other people, they would be, actually be able to come to the police and because they're legal residents who have a right to work. Um, if we had more legal immigration, that would be one thing. Uh, they would also command a different kind of labor uh, strategy. I mean, if you're a legal worker, um, you are going to be um, negotiating a different type of salary. So I think it would tamp down a kind of rampant black market in humans, uh, which is problematic for the same reason that having black markets and other goods and services. So that would, be, that would be one thing. The other thing I would say is that, you know, there's this fear that if we open up uh, and we say, oh, you know what, whoever wants to come to America can come here, uh, some demographers have looked at that and they, they go around the world and there are surveys out there and it's something like, I read one uh, uh, article that talked about how 157 million people around the planet have said they want to move to America. And so restrictionists, not necessarily Ramesh, but other restrictionists will say, can you imagine if we had open borders and we just let anybody who wants to come here, come here, we would be swamped immediately by 157 million new people. In fact, you know, I want to weigh 185 pounds. Uh, that is, you know, that is what I will tell every survey person. I'm not going to do it. The revealed preference is radically different. Um, in, in Europe, uh, under the EU, um, a, a lot of Greeks say they want to move to Germany because Germany is a good functioning country with a great economy, 
less than 1% of Greeks have moved to Germany. After Germany, West Germany and East Germany reunified, East Germans, only 15% moved to West Germany. Uh, Puerto Ricans, this is a, uh, and I have this down here. Yeah, there are uh, 3 million Puerto Ricans who are American citizens living on the island of Puerto Rico. They are United States citizens. They have absolute right of movement into America. 89%, they, they dislike how things are going on in PR in, in Puerto Rico. Fewer than 84,000 of them move to the U.S. every um, so all I'm saying is if we let more people, if we, if we allow the people who want to come here, um, I think it will, be, it will be a manageable flow and it will be good for them and it will be good for us because it does expand the economy and it does enrich our culture and social. The U.S. has long had a policy of excluding would-be legal immigrants here if um, there are signs that they won't uh, be able to support themselves if there'll right. be so-called public charges. Yeah. The exact criteria changed over time. And that was actually moving back to Ellis Island. Day. Does that continue yeah. to be the case? Uh, yeah, I think there's, I think there's uh, a real um, reason to say, or rather this, that if you, you enter the United States with the understanding that if you become a public charge and you don't have a person here who is willing to take accountability for you, which my all of my grandparents had. They had relatives who said, you know, I'll pledge that, you know, if this person becomes a bum, I'll be I'll be feeding them. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's good to say, you know, that the, the welfare state, immigrants don't abuse the welfare state. The, the biggest thing that, is, uh, you know, public money that goes towards immigrants is that when immigrants have children, uh, oftentimes, who are U.S. citizens, they go to K through 12 school. That's a lot of money every year. It's not exactly welfare what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think so. One of the problems is the Trump administration has recently talked about really cracking down on this public charge stuff. And part of the response there is that that would give a lot of discretion to people in the immigration uh, service to just kind of arbitrarily say, you get in, you don't. I, I don't like that. But yeah, I, I think that makes total sense. But that will wrap up the uh, cross-examination between the two guests. And now you have heard their questions for each other, their responses to those questions. And we would like to hear from you. Uh, the more concise we make this break in terms of if you haven't already jotted down a question for either of our guests, uh, Please get those out to, I guess it is, the aisles where people are gathering those. We'll take just a, a, a short intermission, if you will. Um, stretch a little bit, write down the questions, and we will continue shortly. So far, so good. No bloodshed. Yeah, everybody's pretty mellow. <laughs> Stack of them for you. Oh my goodness. Are they brilliant? I, I don't know. I didn't really ask. <laughs> yeah. 
more for you. Thank you. Yep. More brilliance. Thank you. They've been out about five. Five, okay. Ramesh comes back, we can get started. Yeah, I think as soon as Ramesh gets back. Sure. Just a moment or so, if, uh, if you know some people that might be up at the top of the hall, just out in the hallway that have not yet left, if you could call them back in and we'll get underway here very shortly with the Q&A. As we settle back in, as we settle back in, I know a lot of you would like to have your questions uh, addressed to both of our guests. We'd like to begin that now, if we could, please. Some very good questions that have come, some that have been uh, directed specifically to one side or the other, uh, some that are kind of more fired at, at both sides, if you will. Uh, the very first one did not have a label on it, but I found it uh, intriguing. This was, this was the very first question that came. And so I would like to uh, 
uh, pose this and I will give um, Nick the first try at this and, and maybe for some of these that we have that are more or less addressed to, to, uh, to both sides to sort of have, we'll alternate a little bit and, and do about a minute or so um, on each side to, uh, to see what the thoughts are from both. Uh, so the first question for you, Nick, um, this is the general thought. Should anyone who comes to America be considered different from citizens? Why or why not? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question that we didn't really get into. You know, having legal residents here, being uh, legal to work and live and pay taxes is one thing. Citizenship is something very different. The United States, uh, and I think this is actually hurt our discussions. We've always equated people moving here with them becoming citizens. Other countries don't do that. Increasingly, it's not clear that people who move here necessarily want to become citizens. They might want to be long-term permanent residents and things like that. Um, so I don't, uh, you know, I think that's a very separate question. Uh, and as long, uh, but under the Constitution, by the way, I mean, like, you don't get to vote uh, in elections, but you do get due process, you do get all sorts of basic considerations. Ramesh, your thoughts? So there's an argument for um, having kind of sort of rotating participation in the U.S. labor market, which is one of the great blessings that anybody in the world can have. Um, but I think that when we ask people here and we want them to participate in our economy, they want, we want them to work for us, we should be asking them to be part of our society. And that is to say we can't compel them to be citizens, but the goal of our immigration policy ought to be to get the people who are coming here to work here to be full participants in American society, and that means potentially becoming citizens as well. Question directly for you, Ramesh. How would you deal with the issue of refugees? The quote, pause period is often looked at as a black spot on the U.S. because of our blocking Jewish refugees of the Holocaust. Would this be allowed to happen again? Yeah. So um, I think that if we want our refugee policy to be successful as a humanitarian matter, then generally we are going to want to help settle refugees near the countries they are coming from, um, where we can generally do a lot more good than taking people here in terms of sort of bang for the buck. Um, that said, like if you wanted to take that principle to its logical conclusion, you'd have something like a zero refugee policy. I don't favor that. I think that refugees are particularly helpful in a way to the United States in bringing with them the, the experience of oppression and getting out from under it. Um, so I think that we should take in some refugees, um, but, but I think we have to be clear-eyed uh, about how we can do the most good. And for example, the Syrian refugee crisis from a few years ago, I think in general, we're gonna do much more good for more people by helping people settle in the Middle East with our support rather than bringing them to the United States. Nick, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that, you know, when the United States is directly responsible for creating conditions that cause refugees, we have a particular responsibility in that. And that includes places like Syria and a number of Central American countries where, uh, you know, when Ronald Reagan, who was a very pro-immigrant person, there's a fantastic debate, you can find it on YouTube, where George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan in 1980 are having a debate in Houston, and they're arguing over who will do more to help illegal immigrants become fully part of American society, because they said, you know, these guys, they are the backbone of America. They do our work. We want them here. Um, Reagan destabilized many parts of Central America. For American foreign policy did that, and that's part of the reason why we have Central American refugees coming here. I think we owe people whose countries we bomb or otherwise engage in and disrupt, we owe them a special uh, concern, and that's certainly the case with Syria. We had no reason to be in Syria, and I think as a result, our, you know, we, we owe people from the Middle East whose countries we either, either bombed or occupied uh, special attention. This question for you, Nick, and it picks up on, on one of the points that you were making uh, during your presentation. 
Um, is it possible to have a completely open border? As you noted, most individuals are flocking to three states, New York, California, Texas. Are those states, or if there were others so identified, would they have, or do they have, could they be projected to have enough infrastructure to maintain the type of increase that we could see? Uh, you know, it's interesting because immigrant flows you know, they, they, it ebbs and flows based on economic opportunity and other, other factors. Um, and, you know, in a place like New York City, uh, where I live, uh, there seems to be a lot of, you know, room to expand. New York City is already at an all-time historical high in population, and there are more people moving there because it makes sense. Uh, there's ways to, um, I think, absorb that. What I would be more in, in favor of is a kind of return to an Ellis Island model where you show up here and as long as you don't have, uh, you get vetted, as long as you don't have a violent criminal record, you don't have communicable diseases or other serious uh, public health issues, you probably get in. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff takes care of itself once, um, you know, once you do that. Your thoughts, Ramesh? Well, I mean, you know, you part of the vetting, as you yourself have suggested, should also include not being a public charge. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, this this allows our you know, immigration policy to be determined by a lot of arbitrary factors, including proximity. A lot of people in the world, we're not going to take all of them in. Everybody who wants to be in the United States and we ought to have a deliberate policy about who we take and who we don't. The good news is, you know, Mexico, in terms of proximity, had always been the biggest sender of people. There's a net outflow of Mexicans from America over the past several years. Uh, the other countries that are sending a lot of people here are India and the, and the subcontinent and China. They're not adjacent, uh, and those flows will regulate them. This is a question addressed to either side, and it does touch on points that uh, both of you did make. Uh, I'll begin with uh, you, Ramesh, for this. Um, you both made points regarding skill levels uh, and uh, the, the references to the allegations of crime and so forth. This goes directly to that. What about the safety of current citizens and immigrants? Shouldn't we protect that which we have worked for? Just because they are smart does not mean that they are moral. We already deal with a crime that is present already. Why increase the risk? Your thoughts first, Ramesh. So um, people often, supporters of immigration often point out accurately that immigrant crime levels are lower uh, in aggregate than native-born crime levels. And that's true. That is um, something that we should keep in mind, and we should certainly resist the demonization of immigrants as though they're a bunch of, you know, like a sort of a criminal horde. Um, on the other hand, we don't just want immigrants whose crime levels are lower than national average, we want them to be really, really low. Why should we bring, be bringing people when, again, there are so many people who want to come here um, without having pretty rigorous screens uh, and trying to make sure that we are getting the best of the best of the rest of the world? Um, I think that this is an issue that lends itself to demagoguery, but I do think there's a little bit of something there as well. Nick? I, I don't really. This question then does uh, go to you, Mr. Gillespie. Um, you spoke about breaking down immigration to a, a more localized model and, and talked about the percentages and what it would mean particularly to this uh, community of Midland, Michigan. This question asks, how would the, quote, even allocation of roughly 500 extra immigrants in Midland work? As stated, the immigrants move to areas where immigrant communities already exist. Wouldn't an even allocation to the whole United States be very costly or, as this person uh, questions, even impossible? I'm not sure uh, how to answer that. I suspect, uh, would you be able to uh, absorb a couple hundred people a year? And let's think about it this way, just call them migrants. Would you be able to suck in a bunch of people from Ohio? You know, they have, I lived in Ohio for 20 years. They have very different cultures here. They don't get along with Michigan. You guys are natural enemies. You know, can you absorb that? You'd be surprised if people show up needing housing and you don't have a terrible government that doesn't allow for zoning and building and things like that. Houses get built. Restaurants expand. Um, you know, 
you hire new people because there's more of a demand. I think it works out pretty well. Your thoughts, Ramesh? I guess the, I think that's a great question. I think that um, uh, immigrants, so if you're concerned about assimilation, one of the things you're worried about is the development of ethnic enclaves, uh, particularly if there are pockets of poverty that are concentrated in those enclaves. And so if you sort of do a thought experiment where immigrants are evenly distributed around the country, you have dealt with some of that problem in an automatic way that does not reflect reality. Um, and I think you also have to ask about, like, lots of part places in the country are not thriving economically. And it's easy to say, well, immigrants aren't going there. What do they care about immigration? Well, maybe um, some of the people there want to move to parts of the country that are building up economically, that are growing faster. But housing in those places is much harder to come by that's affordable, in part because you've got this waves of immigrants, um, sometimes immigrants who are used to housing conditions that are not quite as good. Um, and you are bid out of the kind of housing that Americans find acceptable. Well, there's other things you could do about that, right? You could liberalize housing policy in a lot of those places. But where immigrants move can have an effect on people elsewhere in the country because we have a national economy, we have a national country, we have, in short, a nation. Next question will begin uh, with you, Ramesh, uh, talking about the, the different types of system, and it kind of gets into the how do we define what we would do? Are we talking about mass immigration? Are we talking about partial immigration, the pause period? This sort of gets into that territory. How would you feel about a system where a certain number of people come in each year, work for six months, pay taxes, and then go back? After that, could they apply for citizenship? Right, so um, I'm not a huge fan of the guest worker idea. Uh, I think that uh, for a lot of reasons, it would be um, unlikely to work in practice, um, you know, just as uh, sort of a, um, there's nothing more sort of oxymoronic than a temporary government program. Uh, the temporary guest workers are likely not to uh, be all that temporary, uh, particularly under contemporary circumstances. Um, and, you know, we've, you know, so six months is one proposal that people made. People have often talked about a year, in which case, well, what are these temporary workers? They have kids here. And those kids are American citizens. And then do you want to break up the family? Uh, or do you want to try to deport an American citizen? I mean, there's just there's all kinds of practical problems in that kind of proposal. And just, again, in general, I just think that, particularly given American history, we don't want a situation where we're relying on labor for people that we don't want to admit to full citizenship. Good system, Nick, or no? Yeah, I, you know, I think the more kind of... Uh, detail oriented and saying, okay, you got six months, you can do this job but not this job, you can have a kid or not the but you know that the more complicated you make it, the more likely it is to fail. Um, people who decide to move, uh, whether it's across the country or into a different country, um, you know, they're making a big commitment and um, you know, and they're they're probably gonna be all in or not. I just don't think trying to come up with these like really rigid kind of rule bound things work as much as just saying, look, you can come here, um, you're not gonna get a free ride, you know, carry your weight and you can work, live, pay taxes, et cetera. Um, that's, it, it just, it's a more elegant solution. Nick, a question for you. What is the impact of mass immigration on public health? Uh, you know, I think it's nothing. Um, if anything, I, you know, it's probably, it helps us. Um, people become more robust. There's no reason to believe, you know, ag again, um, you know, and this goes back to Ellis Island, and certainly when we're talking about stuff like the coronavirus, you want people to be checked out before they come here, but, you know, we're, we're doing pretty well. We've been absorbing, you know, millions of people into the country over the past, you know, several decades, and uh, the plague has not, uh, you know, come. So I think it's all good. Ramesh? Time for one uh, more question then, and we'll address this first to you, uh, Ramesh. Um, 
given the statements that you've made uh, so far, how would you tackle the question, what about those seeking asylum? Where does that fall under the views that you've presented tonight? Well, I think that you would want to uh, make sure that those seeking asylum are actually in fear of persecution or violence as opposed to being economic migrants who are using uh, the asylum process. Um, but, and you would want, I think, the general principle of seeking asylum from, uh, well, frankly, in and then from uh, a third party country, if that is the first safe place that you get to, makes sense. Um, so I actually, you know, I think that's a case where, for example, the administration's policy toward Mexico makes a lot of sense. I, you know, I just, um, you know, asylees who come here, who come to the border or to an American consulate or embassy and, and say, you know, I want asylum and enter the process, they're following the law. Uh, we don't have the, you know, the, you know, just as DMVs are always hell holes, so are things related to immigration. I would just argue, you know, economic, uh, you know, migrating for economic, economic opportunity should be a good enough reason to get you in here, I think, it generally, uh, all things being. I said that would be the last question, and I'm watching uh, the time on behalf of Professor Moots, but um, for all the good ones that still remain up here, uh, this one, having personally parents that come out of uh, the so-called greatest generation, seeing a cross-section of uh, some uh, population and demographics here, um, Let's close with this first. Nick, your thoughts. Um, do you think there's a difference in the attitudes of immigrants toward Americans now versus, say, 70 to 80 years ago? For example, people may have been more willing to assimilate uh, and may have been eager to in the past, but not as much now. And if so, what are the risks of allowing mass amounts of people in who do not wish to adopt American values? Uh, you know, that's a kind of fascinating question, and it's, it's particularly interesting to me because my, as I mentioned, my Italian grandparents never spoke English, which is generally given as the first sign of assimilation. And they were idiots for not learning English, I have to say. They really narrowed their economic prospects as well as their cultural and social prospects. It was a mistake. I don't know why they didn't learn English because they never learned English and I never learned Italian, so I never had that conversation with them. Um, one thing that is interesting is that uh, Pew, uh, Pew Research people look at Hispanic, uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants from Mexico and Latin America. They find that they are learning English as rapidly as immigrant cohorts did in the past. And so what you find is that in a, a, you know, a generation that moves here speaks mostly the foreign language at home. There's the next generation where it's kind of half and half, and then by the third generation, there's no no households that are speaking the old language in a dominant way. That was always the case, you know, 100 years ago, it's the case now. And so you're actually seeing that. And then when we talk about American values, I don't think American values have to do with even saluting the flag or speaking English, I think it has to do with you know, uh, an ethic of work, personal responsibility, um, and kind of being a good person. And I, I just don't see any reason to think that people who are coming here now are somehow not on that same track. Ramesh, your thoughts? Well, um, my parents didn't teach uh, the kids Telugu, and it turns out, it took me a while to figure this out, that that was so that they could talk to each other without us understanding uh, what they were saying. Um, so uh, I think that, again, this is American society more than the immigrants have changed. It's not that they're less than, worse than, inferior to previous waves of immigration. Um, English is, for example, being acquired at the same rate. I would say that the differential, though, the cost of not having English are higher in today's economy, in today's society, than they were back then. And that's the sort of thing that our immigration policy ought to take account of. I think that it's not, again, you know, sort of the, the question of American values. I think American culture, in ways that were sometimes bad, what, but sometimes good, was more self-confident 
a hundred years ago and more willing to insist on a kind of cultural price of entry um, than we are today. And that too is something that we have to take account of when we devise an immigration policy that works for immigrants and native born people alike. Very good questions from all of you and very good response and give and take from our two guests. We move to our closing comments now, five minutes each. We will begin with you, Mr. Gillespie, to uh, make your closing statement tonight. And I'll, I'll stay seated uh, because, uh, you know, I'm lazier than my uh, immigrant grandparents. Uh, but uh, two, two points that I'll make in, uh, in closing. One is that, and Ramesh had uh, alluded to the idea that there's an anti-immigrant backlash and, uh, you know, that helped elect Donald Trump. And so we really need to kind of time out a little bit on immigration or we need to reduce the flow and change the quality of immigrants coming in, more skilled, you know, less, you know, less unskilled, things like that. I'm going to question that. I don't think there is any immigrant backlash. Uh, there's no question that Trump and, and many people, not just Republicans, either demagogue this. Bernie Sanders is demagoguing the idea of open borders. He calls it a Koch brothers plot because he thinks, you know, if you have a lot of immigration, it's going to bring in a lot of low skilled workers who are going to reduce the wages of uh, union, you know, would be or actual unionized workers. There's no evidence for that. But you get this immigration demagoguery on both sides of the aisle. But in fact, when you look at things like Gallup and Pew and people who track this, there's a record high, according to Gallup, of 75% of Americans. Uh, who say that immigration is a good thing for them. 65% of Republicans, these are record highs as long as they've been studying this. So first, there is no anti-immigrant backlash, okay? And we're, we're at what is, used to be called a full employment economy. We have 3% unemployment. Uh, Donald Trump in a Super Bowl ad was touting the fact that unemployment for Hispanics and blacks are at record lows. We can use more workers. We want our economy to expand a little bit. And in order to do that, you know, we can become more productive, each of us, but we can also expand the number of people here, the number of workers, the number of output, the number of uh, the amount of consumption. Now, th the other point, and this is what I'll, I'll end with, is, I, and I say this as somebody who, uh, I went to grad school in Buffalo, New York, or, you know, if, if it's not ground zero of the Rust Belt, you know, and I guess Buffalo can't win anything, they can't win a Super Bowl, so they don't get to be, you know, Detroit is like ground zero of the Rust Belt or Cleveland or something. They're not even that. But uh, when I went to, I was there in the early 90s, Buffalo uh, had fewer than half the number of people it had in its peak in 1950. A lot of industrial Midwestern cities and actually a lot of major American cities in the eastern two thirds of the country peaked in population in 1950. Um, one of the problems that that drove home to me, and then, I, and I'm sorry, I also, for a good chunk of the past 20 years, I lived either full-time or part-time in southwestern Ohio, outside of Cincinnati and Oxford, Ohio. Cincinnati is another town whose best days are behind it. Uh, they, the population there peaked. The real problem isn't when we have too many immigrants coming here. The real problem is when the immigrants stop coming. And there are large parts of this country, whether they're immigrants or migrants from outside the country or within the country, where there is a brain drain, uh, where there is just a population, a depopulation going on. And that's where your problems really begin. Um, and this is something that America has to think about. We had a tremendous run in the 20th century for a number of reasons, most of which were historical accidents, but also we were an immensely productive country uh, because of World War I, European uh, industrial might was destroyed because of World War II. European and Japanese, I mean, the, the world was destroyed and America was able to, and of course the Soviet Union couldn't, you know, they, the Soviet Union collapsed because they couldn't produce enough cigarettes and blue jeans and rock records for their people. It was, you know, they couldn't produce anything. America was a productive place. Anybody who was anyone wanted to come to the U.S. We are at the risk of losing that sense of primacy because we are making it harder for people to come here uh, because we are not as free and dynamic econo economically, and I think even in many ways socially than we used to be. And this is the problem that we need to be dealing with, not too much immigration, but the fact that there are more and more reports 
that smart people from the developing world, from nations like China and India, are bypassing the U.S. They're going to Canada. They're going to countries in Africa. They're going to South America. That's the real fear, and that's the real conversation we should be having, I think, about immigration. So thank you very much. In our match, your closing thoughts, please. Thanks. Um, so I want to make three points. Uh, first, about public opinion. Uh, it is true, as, uh, as Nick said, and as I said earlier, that the public seems to be coming more favorable towards immigration. Um, however, it is also true that only a minority of Americans wants more immigration. Gallup also finds that something like a, only about a third of the country would like more immigration, which is not to say necessarily that all of the people in that third would like to say double it the way that um, people in both parties tried to do a few years ago. And if you ask people polling questions based on sort of how many immigrants we should take, should it be a million, should it be 500,000, should it be 200,000 a year, you generally get large majorities who want less than we have today. Um, all of which, again, I think adds to the argument that, uh, that there are at least strong sections of the country that, that want less and are skeptical of more. Second, on the economy. Uh, Nick mentioned how immigrants do jobs Americans won't do. Um, well, uh, there is no job category men, uh, maintained by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in which immigrants are a majority of workers. Um, there are um, job categories in which wages are probably lower than they would be without low-skilled immigration and in which there is less mechanization than there would be without low-skilled immigration. Um, it seems to me that we could have a reduction in the numbers of low-skilled immigrants without making major ec having major economic damage in this country. Um, the point also on the economy that is made sometimes about we are needing younger people to invigorate our geriatric society. Doesn't account for the fact that immigrants are getting older, just like the rest of us, um, just like the world in general. Um, and if we really believe that argument for immigration, then we should be having a different immigration policy in which the number one age category that has been rising over the last 20 years isn't people over age 55. Third, on the point about assimilation, uh, Nick mentioned the tremendous run we had in the 20th century. And it often is brought up in these immigration debates. People will say, you know, people back in the day, they said the Irish would never assimilate and the Italians would never assimilate and how stupid they were to have those concerns. But if you look at the indicators of success for each of these groups, when did most of it take place? It took, most of it took place during the period when we had low to zero immigration, 1920 to 1965. That's when these groups of people joined the vast American middle class. It seems to me that that is highly unlikely to be a coincidence. And if we want immigration to continue to be the success in our country that it has historically been, and it has historically been, then we should have a more deliberate immigration policy that is actually geared toward that goal rather than what we have today, which is a policy that does not look like anybody designed it on purpose. Thank you very much. Is mass immigration bad for America? You may have come in with a preconceived notion. You may have come in with a completely open mind, but I think we would all agree that we have had two uh, very well thought out points of view presented tonight. So on behalf of everyone, I would like to uh, thank once again, uh, Nick Gillespie of Reason Magazine, Ramesh Pernoru of National Review for their contributions here tonight. An honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you to Professor Glenn Moots for uh, that opportunity. Uh, and thanks to all of his student support staff for their work. He mentioned the reception and so forth afterwards. Uh, and happy viewing of State of the Union and impeachment wrap-ups. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It was good to have you here. Thanks very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you.